the speaker of this morning evening is Professor Tony Payan uh, from uh, Rice University. Uh, uh, Professor Payan is the Francois and Edward the Yenan Fellow for Mexico uh, Studies, and he is the current director uh, from the Center for the United States and Mexico at the Baker Institute in this uh, prestigious, prestigious university in, uh, in, in Houston, um, Texas. Uh, uh, Professor Payan has also been the president of the Associ Association of Borderland uh, Studies between the years uh, 2009 and 2010. And uh, his research uh, focuses primarily on border studies, particularly in the US-Mexico border. Welcome, Tony. It's a pleasure having you with us today. The floor Thank is you, yours. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. And I want to acknowledge my uh, colleague and friend, Elizabeth Salamanca, and of course, Camelia Tigao, who spent some time with us at the Baker Institute in, in Houston. So I'll try to keep to my time. Uh, let me uh, uh, just say that I, I very much appreciated the uh, uh, remarks by uh, 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 Mr. Mehta, uh, because indeed I think uh, uh, we have to consider uh, that uh, Mr. Trump has not fundamentally changed uh, U.S. law. Uh, he has interpreted and reinterpreted U.S. law, and the changes that we are looking at in the United States are through EOs or executive orders. Uh, and they're reversible. And so we are waiting for the November elections to see what happens, what's gonna happen to, uh, to these executive orders. Uh, uh, I think uh, there is a high possibility that some of them, at least the harshest of them, will be reversed by uh, uh, a uh, potential Biden president, but not necessarily. Uh, I think uh, what we are looking at in the United States is essentially a change in mood. So an important question to contemplate here is whether we are looking at a fundamental change uh, in attitudes towards immigration in the United States or not. And that depends on a number of things that are going on. Uh, and that has to do with uh, the COVID-19 crisis and the fact that there are 30 million uh, unemployed individuals in the United States. And the priority for the jobs available in the United States are going to be for these 30 million uh, citizens of the United States and, uh, uh, and residents of the United States, legal permanent residents in the United States who are unemployed. And so I don't, I wouldn't trust that Biden would immediately reverse some of the, these uh, most stringent EOs. Um, uh, that has been Trump's uh, idea that uh, 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 to change the the, the uh, uh, to change the flow of immigration uh, in order to prioritize uh, the economic citizenship of U.S. citizens and uh, and permanent residents as well, uh, and I think that will be a priority for uh, uh, Biden himself, and that, that the recovery in the United States is going to be quite difficult, and that's going to be. And that's going to take a while. So they're probably going to, probably going to think along different lines, uh, but similar uh, to Trump's uh, in terms of prioritizing uh, U.S. citizens. And we have to think about that. Uh, the, uh, the other thing is, will there be comprehensive immigration reform? I think there is an opportunity for comprehensive immigration reform under a potential Biden presidency after November. We'll see what happens. Things are not assured. But that will depend on two other things. Um, and we have written about this particular issue. One is border security. And uh, the reality is that the United States has on purpose not defined border security. There isn't a definition. There isn't a marker. Uh, there are no benchmarks for border security. This is a, a moving goalpost. And as long as the uh, federal administration does not define what border security means, uh, it's never gonna be achieved, even though the numbers are moving in the right direction. Uh, so my guess is that the United States has refused, both political parties refuse to define border security uh, precisely because it gives them much more room for maneuver in restricting immigration, asylum seekers, and so on. So there's, a, there's, a, there's an intention behind uh, uh, the vague uh, definition of border security. And the other thing is what to do with the 11 million undocumented immigrants in the United States. If we do not resolve those two major roadblocks, there's not going to be a major uh, immigration reform. Uh, we've seen it before. We've seen the attempt to do that in, in the past. Uh, the other thing, uh, uh, I think the, uh, in the case of Mexico, there was a missed opportunity. Uh, uh, Mexico was reacting to the renegotiation of NAFTA, which uh, replaced uh, the, 
which resulted in the USMCA replacing uh, NAFTA on July 1st, uh, just a little over a month ago, uh, Mexico should have included a labor liberalization chapter. But Mexico is always reacting. Mexico has, is, has not been proactive in trying to establish its interests in the United States. Um, even when you examine the positions of the 50 consulates in the United States, 50 consulates or so in the United States is mostly a defensive uh, position. It's trying to defend immigrants. And so Mexico has not been very aggressive on that. And I think it was a missed opportunity to try to include uh, an expansion of the TN visas. Uh, or a system of visas for North America. I think that was a, a wasted opportunity on the, on the uh, Lopez Obrador administration. Uh, uh, I, um, uh, I don't think that the United States uh, uh, will become a haven for immigration in the near future, even under, the, under, a, uh, uh, under a Biden uh, administration, as I mentioned, not only because of the 30 million undocumented, but also because there is something else going on in the United States, and that is an undercurrent of uh, anxiety among the United States uh, population, especially the European descendant population, uh, that the makeup of the United States is changing quite a bit. And Trump has obviously uh, been able to use these uh, fears uh, much uh, uh, to his political advantage. Um, if you look at the demographic changes in the United States, for example, you realize very quickly that the European descendant population is now well under replacement. For example, in Texas, um, I'm currently, I'm, I'm at this moment, I'm in Ciudad Juarez, in my house in, in Ciudad Juarez, but I'll be returning to Houston in a couple of weeks. But if you look at Texas, last year in, well, 2018, Texas added nine Hispanic residents for every Anglo resident. That, that Texas gained that year. So the gains by minorities in the United States, almost 20% Hispanics now, uh, 13, 14% African-Americans and Asians are actually growing faster than Hispanics and, um, and African-Americans at this point is such that it's creating a lot of anxiety in the, in the European or, or white, the white population of the United States. Uh, and I think that uh, the, the uh, fertility rates also show that uh, European descendant population are at a, a fertility rate of 1.6. Uh, the required replacement level is 2.1. Hispanics are also dropping quite fast at a 2.3, 2.4. Uh, currently, African Americans are about 2.1 and Asians are the fastest growing group. And by Asians, we mean Indians, Chinese, Taiwanese, so Asians, uh, Filipinos, so it's difficult to speak of Asians as a single group uh, per se, because uh, they're so, so varied, it's such a vast continent. Uh, so there's a lot of anxiety in this country and it, uh, how will that anxiety on the changing face of America be resolved in law if there is an attempt at comprehensive immigration law in the uh, comprehensive immigration reform in the future, I'm not sure. But I don't think it's going to resolve itself necessarily in the direction of greater openness of the U.S. immigration system. With that, I conclude my uh, seven minutes. I don't think the United States is going to be in the future the kind of immigration nation that we expect it to be. Countries like India and Mexico and many others must now shift their policy to development internal development to provide for the opportunities for their own population. I think the immigration system in the United States is closing. It is a different closing than it was uh, 70, 60, 70 years ago. And it is uh, uh, definitely going to close over the uh, mid part of the 21st century. Uh, so we must be prepared for that. The US is going to become much pickier about who comes in and it's likely to change towards much higher skilled immigrants, very selectively chosen. So those are some of the remarks in seven minutes. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Sylvia. And again, hello to uh, Elizabeth Salamanca and of course, Camelia Tigao. Thank you, uh, Tony. Um, thank you, especially because uh, you you were so strict with the with the timing.